Thank you, Lord. For those of you watching or listening online, thank you so much. From time to time, we have people that will reach out and let us know that they're watching or listening. We love it when you guys do that. It's inspiring. It's encouraging when a message or something that is said or done is a blessing to you. Thank you so much uh, for you that follow and listen and watch online. We're going to be turning in our Bible today to Psalms Again, chapter 57, this time we're going to be in chapter 57 of the book of Psalms. This is where I feel the Lord has led us to today. And while you're getting there, I will tell you that there are some times that I will preach a message that comes across more as a collective whole that God will deal with us as a people, as a body, as a church. And I still feel like that in some regard, God will do that today, but I think today's message will probably uh, be more of a personal thing, more of an individual thing, because truth told, many of us may be married, we maybe have family or something like that, and our faith walk is not just a product of what they do. It should be a product of what we believe and what we do. To take it one step further, I want you to be reminded as we get ready to read this and endeavor into this message God's given me, one of these days you will stand before God. The Bible actually tells us that every knee shall bow. Every tongue is going to confess. And if you were able to get a visual, if I could paint a picture this morning, and you were able to visualize the judgment seat of God for just a moment, and in that judgment seat, I don't know if there'll be a line behind you. I don't know if there'll be people waiting for their turn. I don't know exactly what that will look like. But based on what I read in the Word of God, I want you to see yourself in that judgment seat of God this morning, and you're not going to look over to your right, and your wife will be there, or your left, and your husband will be there. Your children and your grandchildren will not be there. When you stand or kneel before the Lord, you are going to be before God as an individual. When you're judged, you're not going to be judged by how good your wife lived. You're not going to be judged on how good your parents lived. You'll be judged according to you. That is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, if you had lived an unrighteous life, well, it wouldn't be fair that your unrighteous life would determine a righteous family member's outcome because we're all individual people. The fact is, the Bible has shown us that when the rapture takes place, the catching away of the saints, it gives us a depiction that I think we need to remember. Two will be in the bed. One will be taken the other left. Now, that doesn't mean that in every marriage there will be somebody left. That is simply to let you understand that just because your wife loves God does not mean you're automatically by default going to heaven. On earth, your marriage may be blessed because you have a saved spouse And because of their prayers and because of their relationship with God, you reap the benefits in the marriage because of their faith and their walk with God. But do you understand that one day there will be a very independent evaluation, one-on-one with you and God? Has everybody got that this morning? Anybody here today says, God, help me. Woe is me. But with that said this morning, I want to read our text, Psalm chapter 57, verse number 1. If you have it, say amen. Psalm 
So the Bible here says, to the chief musician, Altesheth, Miktam of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. Now that part may seem irrelevant, but as I get ready to read the following verses and words, I want you as we read this to visualize David is in a place of his life where he's being pursued by Saul. His life could at any point be taken from him. All he's trying to do is be God's man, and it seems like he's being chased and threatened of his life because of it. So here's what David says while he is in a cave hiding from Saul with his life on the line. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. For my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Been going through anything? Sometimes you just got to say, I'm holding on till this stuff passes. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. And I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Selah. Now, if you haven't read anything else, I want you to look very closely at verse 7. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is is fixed. I will sing and give praise. After everything we've read thus far, what is David saying? I got a lot going on in my life right now. I got a lot against me, but I just want to make one loud and proud declaration. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed, O God. He says in verse 8, Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. I want to preach to you on a very simple title, just two words this morning. This is the way God gave it to me, and I'm going to give it to you this way. Fixed faith. Fixed faith. Will you raise your heart and hand to God and let's begin to pray this morning. Lord of heaven and earth, we pray this morning one more time that you will smile down from heaven upon the word that it is delivered today in the right spirit with the anointing and with conviction. Challenge our hearts. God, help us to be a people likened unto the people that you desire us to be. A relationship, God, that is a right relationship. And I pray, God, that when we do stand before you, when we kneel down before you, I pray, God, that we'll be able to kneel 
and know that we have been faithful and we had a fixed heart. I pray today, God, let every soul that is challenged find a place of prayer and give the right desire and lay their life before you as you would have them to. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone can say, man, you may be seated. Now, what I'm about to say to you this morning is probably going to come off just a slight bit personal, but I think you need it to be said in a very personal way. I want you to block out everybody around you for just a moment, and I want you to know that what God is saying is saying it to you. It may be even uncomfortable to hear this or to think of this, but there are some people this morning that God laid on my heart God has shown me as I began to pray and seek him, there are some people in our churches today that if it had not been for the fact that their spouse or their parent or a close friend was in church with them, they would not be in church. If their wife was not diligent about serving God, if their spouse, their husband was not determined, we're going to get up, we're going to go to the house of God, they would not be there themselves. Now, I think that it's a wonderful thing to have a spouse that is determined. But in this uncomfortable question that I'm going to ask you, I'd like to ask you, not your wife, not your friend, not your mama or your daddy, but I want to ask you this morning just how fixed are your feelings towards God? Is God everything in your life? Or is God just kind of when I get around to it and if I feel like it, if my wife has the desire to go to church, if my husband feels like going? I want you to have the kind of fixed feelings that if your spouse said, you know what, I don't feel like going to church today, and they fall completely away from God, that even though you love your spouse, that you could say, you know what, I love you, but I've got to be in the house of God if i got to go by myself. Does anyone feel what I'm saying? There needs to be a resolution within you so, so fixed, so determined, so planted on a rock that you say, baby, I love you, and I pray that you'll go to heaven one day, and I pray that we'll both go together. But if I've got to go to heaven by myself, I will go to I'll go to church by myself. I'm gonna if I gotta lift my hands and worship and you don't want to worship as much as that will break my heart, I've got to worship God. I cannot afford to be lost at the end of this race. I need that. Now let me tell you, spouses, something. I am not telling you that it is not a good thing to have an encouraging spouse. As a matter of fact, because there are encouraging spouses is the reason that some people are completely sold out today. I am a product of that myself. I feel like because of my wife's own dedication that while I was scrambling around trying to make up my mind that her influence influenced me in such a positive way that eventually when I finally came to my right mind that I served the Lord and a lot of that had to do with the fact that I had a wife who had fixed feelings towards God. Has anyone else ever seen that in their own life? So I know that it may be personal and I know that it may be uncomfortable comfortable for me to ask you this morning just how fixed your feelings are before the Lord. But here is the reality of the, the whole matter. If your spouse decided to stop coming to church tomorrow, would you continue to come to the house of God? If your wife or your husband tomorrow said, you know, I don't know, I'm just having some reservations about this whole thing of serving God. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Would you continue to pick up your Bible and read it? Would you continue to pray and ask for God to intervene in your life? Or would you just follow along with whatever they thought or whatever they felt? Because the fact is, is that spouses can influence each other the same way that a spouse can influence you in a positive way. A spouse can influence you in a... 
And a spouse that says, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore can easily influence the other in a negative way. Now, I don't remember what the statistics are. I think it was over 90-something percent that they say that when a father, they say statistically they've been able to prove this, that when a father, the head of that house, the man that God has placed as that, that head of the house in his home, when a father makes the decision to serve the Lord and go to church, uh, that there's a 90-something percent chance that the rest of the family will serve the Lord. I've said it and heard it said like this. If you can turn the head, you can turn the whole body. So what I'm saying is, dads, let me tell you, never underestimate the decision that you make as the head of your house. I'm not talking about like bad to the bone, everybody going to do what I'm saying. I'm talking about the position that God placed you in. Never underestimate the value of what a difference that you make as the head of that household. When the rest of the family is struggling and daddy said, hey, y'all, let's get up and go to the house of God. You want to know what impresses me? It's when I see a family, a whole family, children, husband, wife, and the children are sick or the wife is sick. You know what it blesses me when I see daddy get up and take the babies to church? You know why? Because what that tells me is that daddy's got a resolution that is rock solid. And let me tell you, you may not realize this, dads, but that speaks volumes to your children because your children are paying attention and they know what is important to mama. They know what's important to daddy. They know if daddy wouldn't miss a fishing trip for nothing in the world or daddy would get up at four o'clock in the morning to be in a hunting stand at 445. Hey man, those babies know the difference and they're watching everything that you do and your influence is more powerful than you can ever know. What you have to understand about your children is that they are little sponges uh, they are mirrored images of what their parents are going to do. And if you want your parents to have the best upbringing uh, and the best chance at life, uh, it is my belief, according to the word of God, that the best thing you could do is get them in the house of God. But second best of that is that you stay faithful in the things of God. Let them see where mom and daddy's priorities are because you cannot expect your babies to grow up and have priorities and put God first uh, if all their childhood they ever seen uh, was you putting God on the back burner. Am I still preaching a little truth? We need to hear this in America and we, re- we look around and we say, well, it's the witchcraft. That's the reason why America's in the place that it's in. It's a political world. That's why we're in the scheme of the place that we're in. It's this one's fault, the school's fault, because they took prayer out of school. Let me tell you the reason why that the world is in a mess uh, is because daddies and mamas are not being faithful and putting God first uh, because you can't expect a child to put God first uh, if the ones who lay the pattern before them are not doing that themselves say amen somebody can you give God praise this morning for the truth while I'm glad you come to the house of God what is more important and even more valuable and I want you to make sure you never forget this It is more valuable for you to come because of him and not because of them. Well, babe, I love you and I go to church out of respect. I think that's wonderful. You cannot believe how many people this morning on a Sunday morning that are sitting in churches all across the world who are only there because their mom their dad, their husband, or their wife. Do you know, you say, well, pastor, I'm just trying to show my wife I love her and I'm really trying to make a good effort. I am telling you that it is not enough just to come because of them. You need to come because of him. You need your own personal walk with God. Well, so well, my wife does enough praying for both of us. That's not the way it works. Well, my husband, you know, he's a good man of God. He reads the Bible. If I need anything, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll see what he's got to say about it. I think that's fantastic, but that's not where the answer lies. 
You have got to have your own one-on-one with God. If you agree with that, say amen. Have you ever seen what I'm talking about in the church today? It's this thing that's an elephant in the room that we often don't talk about, but I've been known to talk about things people uh, feel uncomfortable and don't like to talk about. But I began to think about what God laid on my heart, and this lack of, of fixed feelings and fixed intentions within a relationship, it makes me think about the relationships that I've seen other people in, and even relationships, even though me and my wife have been together forever, Believe it or not, I've been in many relationships myself, and so has she. While we were young and in the dating scheme, at one time I made a game of it, me and one of my friends, and I was dating nine different girls at the same time, and none of them knew that I was dating any of them. Weirdest thing. But one of the things that I have realized about relationships, and some of you will know what I mean when I say this, it is a miserable thing to be dating someone in an on-again, off-again relationship. Well, this week he loves me, and then come Monday, you know, I think we need a little bit of space. I think we might need a little space, you know what I'm saying? Usually when someone says, I need some space, usually most of us know that typically means that I'm, I'm done. I want to move on, or I'm looking, I got my affection set on something else. No woman or no man wants to be sitting in a room while that their spouse or their significant other is staring across the room at somebody else. You want to know that a person's feelings are fixed where they belong. There is just something about being with someone that you don't have to worry where their affections are. That, you know, there's been times before that my wife and I would joke around and I always say Fabio. I don't know why I say that. I don't even know who that is. Just a name that we've, you know, circulated. I wish she would be at work. And I say, would Fabio have on good cologne today, you know? I'd be kidding with her. She would say, this guy came in and he was asking me questions and everything. And I say, oh, really? I say, he better be careful about all them questions he's asking you. My wife say, yeah, babe. He was like twice my age. I say, yeah. I say, he don't know that, though. Right? But what I'm getting at is I've always told my wife, I said, I know you. I believe that my wife could be put in one of the most vulnerable positions, and I believe she would be faithful to me. There's just some peace of mind as a spouse that you don't have to always worry, what is this other person going to do? Now, we are constantly, and if you don't do this, then maybe you're not normal. I don't know. I, maybe you're better than us. But we are constantly, you know, all the time, babe, you love me, you know, you love me. And I say, yes, I love you. One time I told her, I said, babe, it's only been 45 minutes. If anything changes, I will let you know. She just laughed. It's that feeling of reassurance. But the truth is I know she loves me. and She knows I love her. We created this little weird thing that we do. We have our little love thing, you know, between each other. And years ago, I I made up this thing. I say, you love me? And she'll say, you love me too. Not necessarily a question. It was more of a statement. You love me? She said, you love me too. We have such a resounding fixed love that after all of these years, there's a confidence between us. I don't have to worry. I don't feel like I have to worry. Anybody understand the peace in that? But if you've ever been with someone that every time you turned around, you had to worry about who they were talking to, you had to constantly check your phone to see who they're texting, man, that ain't no kind of relationship. That's a mess. Well, who was that, who you, who was at that job site with you? What does she look like? Is she pretty? You know, has she got on some good smelling perfume? What I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's a sense, of, a, a, a sense of unease that goes along with that. Can you imagine this morning with me for a moment that you're the God of the universe and you've got a peace, kind of like, do you remember when Satan came before the Lord and he said, well, you got a hedge around this old fellow named Job. God loved Job so much and he knew that Job loved God so much There was this fixed relationship that Job had. And his relationship and his feelings toward God were so fixed that God felt like, I don't got nothing to worry about. 
If you want to strike him, if you want to go against him, if you want to tear some things up in his life, I believe that he'll stay faithful. You know what the devil thought? The devil thought for sure. He said, if you'll just let me at him, you know, lift that hedge, uh, surely he will curse you. But God knew, I've got so much confidence in Job, if I lift that hedge and you wipe out part of his children and you take all of the possessions, uh, because here's what what Satan was trying to insinuate. Job is a blessed man. How many of you know Job was very blessed? He had all kinds of animals. He had all kinds of possessions. And he had a whole big family. Hey, Amen. Everybody in town, he had a reputation. Everybody knew Job. And, and Satan was basically saying, the reason that he has that feeling is because of material possessions. But God said, in other words, if Job was living in a crackerjack box, he would still serve me. Man, what kind of faith is that? If he never got another dime, I'm dollar a penny out of heaven. Job would still love me and still go to the dying day. If Job was broke, busted, and disgusted, if Job was not well in his body, he would still be faithful. And Satan didn't believe it. But I want you to see one day when Job's sitting there, his children are dead, his wife's told him to curse God, he's lost all of his possessions, everybody in town is talking about him, his little friend's circle, even they're trying to say, maybe you did something, maybe this was because you weren't faithful. Here he is he's got boils all over his body he's got a broken piece of pottery scraping the pus out of his sores and he said naked I came into this world and naked I'll go blessed be the name of the Lord how many of you could bless God if they repoed your car how many would still bless God if you lost a child how many would still bless God if things fall apart how many would still bless God if your spouse walked out tomorrow How many would still bless God? Job blessed God because his intentions and his mind and heart was still fixed. I'm going to tell you something. When a person is fixed in their feelings in a relationship, it is a good thing. But when they are not fixed, do you know why some people are not fixed in a relationship? I'm going to preach right here to you if you just listen. Why are people sometimes not fixed in a relationship? One word the Spirit spoke to me this morning. Distractions. Distractions. That can be so many things. It can be so many people. It can be so many situations. But many times the reason why a person is not fixed in a relationship is distractions. Truth told, when I read what David said in our text, David was trying to avoid distractions. I told you that Saul was pursuing David. David is in a cave. He's grappling with the fear of his own flesh that he may lose his life. He's grappling with the fact that some of the kingdom and the people have turned against David. He said their teeth are like, you know, sharp razors and they're like a a, a bunch of lions. And here I am hiding out in this cave. These distractions can distract you from your fixed heart. That's why some people are not fixed is because they got distractions Something that would cause you to get your attention on something else. Listen, I hate to break it to you, but sometimes in his situation, people like this, their distractions can be other people. Do you believe that you can hang around the wrong people? You can be best buddies with the wrong people? You can sit around and miserable, just miserable talk with the wrong people. Whine and cry and complain with the wrong people. And what they have to say can be a distraction to you. Do you know churches have split because of distractions from other people? Marriages have split because of distractions from other people. 
It's the reason that David declares that his heart is fixed towards God. What was it that made this shift that David goes from talking about people that are all against him? Why did he say, my heart is fixed, my heart is fixed, O God? Because what David is saying, Sister Patricia, there's a lot of pressure in my life right now. But I just want to make a public confession and declaration to hell. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed, oh God. When you get the phone call and they say, well, if you can't make this month's rent, we're going to have to evict you. And when you hang the phone up, my heart is fixed. My heart is fixed, oh God. When your spouse looks at you and says, I don't think this marriage is working out anymore and I'm not in love with you, I'm going to file for divorce, that you can say, my heart is fixed. My heart is fixed, oh God. If you're going to church and watching online and they say your church is going to close down, after all these years you've been faithful to one church, they say, well, we can't be here no more and we're going to close the church down. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. Oh God, what I'm trying to tell you is that my heart and my emotions and my declaration is not dependent on what everybody else does. It doesn't depend on the stock market. Somebody said here recently that our economy's in trouble and that we're right on the verge of something blowing apart and everything falling apart. I quit watching the news. You know why? Because I put my faith in God and I'm not going to sit around and live in fear for the rest of my life. If we go through another depression, that I'm trusting in God that if the world ain't got but one biscuit left, that God's going to give me part of that biscuit. Say amen. I'm just believing this morning that my God's got my back because one of these days I plan to be in heaven with him. And no matter what the political world looks like, no matter who wins the presidency, no matter what goes on in the public scheme locally, no matter what the church does, no matter what my family does, I'm going to keep serving God. But I'm telling you, if the only reason you come to church is because, well, you know, my, my husband, he, he really loves God and he goes to church and I go in support of him. I don't really go because I have a relationship one-on-one with God. While I'm glad you are here, you need to come because of him, not because of them. You need your own fixed heart. You don't need to ride on your wife or your husband's coattail because it don't work like that. You need to know God for yourself. The reason you're up and down in your emotions is because you're not fixed. Some folks have got some distractions in their life, and if I can slow down for a minute, I need to preach this out. Because there are some people that are struggling in these areas. It's kind of like, I touched on it a little bit earlier, but it's kind of like a wife who goes to work and uh, there's Fabio. He's flattering her. He's enticing her with all the right words. And he's a distraction. It's kind of like the husband who feels like his wife is too busy with the kids and eventually he turns to internet pornography. Distraction in a relationship. In the bigger scope of things, Why are you not on fire for God? Is it distractions? Why is your affection towards God not elite, focused? Why is your love for God like a flame that's almost gone out? I don't know about you, but I think it's time to turn the wick up. As I began to pray this morning and seek the Lord, the Lord reminded me of something that I wanted to share with you. 
from a biblical context, there's many examples of those in the Bible whose, whose resolution, their love, was fixed. And one that stands out to me is a story that maybe you're familiar with, maybe you're not. But it's that of Jacob and his son Reuben. Anybody ever read in the Bible where, the, where it said, Jacob told his son Reuben, he said, you're unstable as water. Now, I don't know about you, but water is pretty unstable. And as a son, I would not want my dad to look at me on his deathbed and say, boy, you as unstable as water. Uh, for those of you that didn't pick up on that, that's not a compliment. But in contrast to that, I want you to listen to this. We see, for example, that some of Jacob's other sons, listen to how he describes his other sons. He says Judah is like a lion. He says that Benjamin is like a wolf. He says that Dan is described as a serpent, not in a negative way, but as a serpent that is wise and, you know, is able, if, if you will. But then we have Reuben, and he looks at his son Reuben and says, boy, you are as unstable as water. What does that really look like in real life? Because I, I have met a lot of people who are on this road, this, this gospel road of serving God, and they're unstable. Well, let me share with you this. Reuben's character proved that like water, water has no form of its own. It has no form or shape. It is only formed by whatever it is put into. If you'll let me preach to you, I think this will make sense. When you pour water into glass, it only holds its form because of what is around it. It does not hold its own form. It's great to be influenced by people. But if the only way you can hold yourself in that cylinder shape of a glass is if you are with your wife and you're dependent on your wife's faith or your husband or your parents' faith. The only way you have form is if the people around you are helping you to hold that shape. You have no form. You're like water. What else? Well, water shifts when the slightest movement or changes, something changes its position. Have you ever noticed? I remember years ago, my my dad got me a job working with a paving company, and I don't remember why, but they had one of these trucks, and it had water in a giant tank on the back. Anybody ever drove one of those? That is a weird ride. I'm talking probably a couple hundred gallons of water in this big tank, and every time you go to put on the brakes and the water inside that tank moves forward, I mean the whole vehicle feels like it's going to lunge forward. You go to turn a curve and all that water inside the tank is sloshing all over the place. You feel like you're about to tip over. The reason is, is because with the slightest movement, water shifts. There are some people that I have met that are like Reuben. Just the slightest change in their environment and they shift. Where their boss said, you got to work overtime. All of a sudden they shift and their attitude gets rotten. Just the slightest little problem or thing happens in their life. All of a sudden, somebody else cusses them out, and they shift. They wake up on Sunday morning, they, well, I don't feel the best today, and they shift. They're not fixed. They've not made a fixed resolution. They've not drawn a line in the sand and say that just because the world around me is shifting, I, I'm, I refuse to shift because everything around me is. You get what I'm saying? That's water. Not only that, but water has no ability to hold its positions when things around it change. And like water, instead of standing firm, I don't know if you know this about water, but water takes the path of least resistance. It takes a fixed person to go against the grain. Now the world may be going its own way, but it takes someone with a definite, made-up mind to go the right way when it's not easy. Listen, you can take water and pour it on an angled table, and it's never going to go uphill. 
If it does call me, we're going to make millions. Water takes the path of least resistance. If you pour water on a table that's unlevel, it's going to the easiest side to drip. It does not go uphill because it's just too easy to go that way. And can you imagine your dad saying, boy, you as unstable as water. You shift with the tide. You're not fixed. You're not determined. You've not got a made-up mind. Do you know the reason why that the church has existed for all the years that it has? I guarantee you this. It ain't on a bunch of wishy-washy, unfixed heart saints. The reason that the church is today where it's at, the reason why this church at Gray Street is still after 50 plus years going on, probably 60, is still here today, is somewhere along the way there were some people in the church that had a fixed heart. The reason why that you show up on Sunday morning every Sunday and you can always already guarantee that unless Brother and Sister Myers are sick in their body, they're going to be here is because somebody had a fixed resolution. It ain't always easy. Let me explain to you. It ain't always easy when I don't feel the best to get up and preach. Uh, when I've had a bad week, believe it or not, I've got bad weeks too. There are times that I work so hard, I'm so tired, I feel like I can't even hardly pick myself up. But I have to come to the house of God. You know why? Because I'm fixed. Uh, I made a declaration a long time ago. God, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna stay and I'm gonna pray. If you'll give me the grace, I'll be in this fight until my dying day, say amen. I had a fixed heart. And there are some of you this morning that the reason why that you're not making spiritual progress is because you need to make some fixed landmarks in your life. Let me read you a verse before I close. Sister Miranda, come to the piano, please. I want to read you out of James chapter 1 and verse 5, and I'm going to show you the reason why some people are always struggling. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing Wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 7 is pretty, pretty tight. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded man is unstable in all. Of his ways. I've had to stop and think about that verse a few times through the years. And the older I've gotten, the more people I've worked with, the more I see the reality of it. You know what I found out about people with a lack of commitment in an area of their life? Those people tend to have commitment issues in multiple areas. Show me somebody who's not committed in the workplace. Oftentimes they're not very committed in marriage either. Sometimes they're not committed to their families, committed to their church family. Believe it or not, those commitment issues will show up and surface in multiple areas of your life. What I'm asking you to do is make a decision on this Sunday morning I'm not going to serve God because my mom does, my dad does, my cousin, my brother. I'm not going to serve God just because my wife goes to church. I'm going because that's what I want. If I let you in on a little secret, don't tell anybody. As a pastor... I'm very observative and I watch people. And I can usually tell just how committed people are when there's more than one, two, three people in a family. I can usually tell where they are spiritually by what they do 
when one other person in that family or spouse is not feeling well. Well, I could stay home and play video games. I could get on eBay. I've been looking for a new rod and reel, you know. I could surf Amazon all day long. If your spouse fell out with God tomorrow, would you continue to serve the Lord? Would you be the stronghold in your household? If your family embraced or dealt with something that just about knocked you clean off your feet, as difficult as it may be, would you still come to the house of God when you found out that your daughter-in-law had cancer? Would you still come to church and say, would you all play, please pray for Anna? If you had prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed all the way up to the day that you went to the funeral, looking down at the casket of the son that you love with all of your heart, and it didn't work out the way you hoped, would you just say, you know what? I, I, I just can't do this thing anymore. I'm, I put all my hope and confidence, and it didn't work out the way I thought it would, so you know what? Just not for me. Or would you continue to be so faithful that you could get up in tears like Brother Matt did and share with the church an instrumental moment of his life that had to do with the very son that he would later lose. That's a fixed heart, brother. You've been serving God all these years with the up and downs and in and outs and all the trials. You've already said, I know I'm not perfect. I'm trying to serve the Lord. I've probably got some flaws here and there. But if there's anything about me, my heart is fixed. I will serve God no matter what. When you're sitting in church and you get a phone call, come to find out your sister passes away unexpectedly. And it rocks the whole family. And after a week or two, you're right back in the house of God, sitting on the same row that she used to sit on with you. That's a fixed heart. We need more people like that in the house of God. We can't understand for the life of us why the, when we look at David... And we said, well, man, David messed up so bad. How in the world can God say that David was a man that was after God's own heart? How is that possible? You know what God was saying? David had some problems in his life. But there's one thing that wasn't a problem. Even though David wavered, David had some issues in other areas. Uh, there's one thing David had going for him. David loved God. David never denounced God. He was after God. And even when he messed up and realized that, he got on his face and sackcloth and ashes, and he prayed and fasted and begged for God's mercy because his heart was fixed. As you stand to your feet this morning, I want to ask you just how fixed your heart is. Not your husband, not your wife, not your mama, not your daddy. What would you do? I'm not going to tell you any names. I'm not going to go into any great detail. But I'll just tell you like this. I've seen some things in my time of serving the Lord that's troubled me. I'll share one of them with you. My wife and I, we went to a church years ago. It was a pastor and pastor's wife, and the pastor was a phenomenal preacher. He was a good man. He had pioneered a work from nothing and had a pretty nice established church doing well. Well, one night after, at about I don't know, 40-something, 50, early 50s. One night he went to bed and he had a heart attack in his sleep and died. Shortly after that, the wife who was a pastor's wife completely stopped going to church, got involved in all kinds of crazy things. And I know trauma does a lot of things to people, so don't misunderstand me. I understand people go through difficulties.